Hey everyone, today I'm going to talk about a relatively recent position of mine, uh, Fair Isaac Corporation, known as FICO. Uh, now this is a, um, a fabulous, fabulous business, um, extremely high uh, business quality uh, that operates uh, within the kind of financial services uh, sector. And today I'll just go over uh, a few of the things that I found researching the company and perhaps some um, resources that I felt found helpful um, as far as, you know, other people who had done a write-up um, and things that I had uh, discovered while following the company. Um, so you, you quite often find these um, really fabulous businesses within uh, financial services. It, it's a bit counterintuitive because capital uh, is a commodity. There's no difference between, um, uh, you know, your brother giving you $5 and a bank giving you $5. It's still the same $5. That uh, money will have a cost and perhaps there's a difference in the cost of capital. But in the at the end of the day, um, money money's a pure commodity. So I've always found it very interesting that um, businesses around capital, capital allocation decisions, um, have often coalesced into these like pretty wonderful uh, businesses. And so the paradigmatic example of that would be uh, Moody's and S&P Global. Um and those are in the same vein as FICO, perhaps not the exact same business quality. Uh, a Moody's or a S&P Global um, have a lot of the same dynamics in terms of uh, capital efficiency and um, uh, being able to sell an intangible that doesn't necessarily need a lot of capital invested um, to produce the returns which is always uh, probably the best type of business one can invest in. And so FICO uh, is a version of that, although it doesn't doesn't benefit from the same uh, cost advantage that um, a Moody's or an S&P Global uh, would confer onto their customers, but we'll get into that. Um, so what does uh, FICO do? So they've got two main business segments. Uh, most predominantly is the scores business. So uh, they offer a credit rating score um, for individual consumers. Um, and so, you know, many, many people would be familiar with this. If you've ever um, tried to get a mortgage or a car loan, perhaps even a student loan, I know in the United States, you know, quite often they'll take into um, the individual credit scores are taken into um, account for all kinds of decisions, like being admitted to a university or um, being approved to rent an apartment. Um, and so that score is uh, produced via an algorithm that's run um, off of a credit data. So credit data is that the uh, credit bureaus collects, collect. There's uh, three large credit bureaus uh, in the United States that FICO runs their algorithm predominantly over that data, um, and it produces a score, um, which uh, is a predictor of credit quality. Um, we'll get into a little bit later the you know, philosophical underlinings of the credit scores and how it differs from um, disruptors in the space. Um, but, you know, over any loan book, the uh, the FICO score is a fairly decent predictor um, of credit performance over, over large populations. Uh, these can, these are consumer credit scores. They, uh, they astride almost every consumer vertical. So they're a, um, a mandatory uh, having a uh, having a FICO score is mandatory for mortgages, 
um, and it's, you know, borderline mandatory, although not legislatively mandatory for a whole other bunch of verticals like um, the credit cards, uh, car loans, um, et cetera, et cetera. They have about four or five different reporting segments in consumer. Um, and they broadly, you know, they broadly dominate uh, that space. So these scores are distributed in uh, two kinds of ways. They're either distributed B2B via the credit bureaus. So whenever a credit decision uh, needs to be made vis-a-vis -a, -vis a mortgage, a car loan, or what have you, the lender would, would use a credit bureau to access the score. Uh, and there'd be a fee um, for accessing that score that FICO charges to the credit bureaus. And then, you know, naturally the credit bureaus charge on to um, lenders. And it's also distributed B2C. So uh, in the early 2000s, um, the company came out with a consumer a, a consumer product called uh, MyFICO, which allowed uh, individuals to access their um, credit scores at, at virtually any point. Uh, which is a great innovation, uh, being able to obviously know what your credit score is at any given time is um, it's really valuable information. Um, a faster growing and perhaps similar vertical in terms of revenue uh, is their software uh, segment. Now, the software broadly is a... Uh, what would be called a decision management solution. So it's a way to um, uh, rationalize a company's data to make um, more sound business decisions. Now using you know big data, uh, previous data from any particular company and uh, making that digestible in a way to make um, rational business decisions in any particular business environment is uh, hugely beneficial. Um, even in my own business, uh, being able to pull out uh, adequate reporting from the system is always um, a very important uh, thing for clients, almost always front of mind. Um, and so this idea that you can take data from your business, rationalize it, make it digestible, and ultimately use that data to make uh, decisions within your own business in a rational and rules-based way um, is something that's always, you know, that's a uh, hugely, hugely beneficial uh, thing to, to, to any business, essential. And going forward, the ability to, you know, use your own data, external data in a way that helps rationalize and uh, your business and make it more efficient is it's only going to, it, it'll become something that's mandatory as a side from a thing that, um, you know, perhaps gives you a, a competitive advantage at one point, it will just become table stakes to play. Um, now that business uh, is in a tr transitionary period. Um, like I talked a little bit with uh, my software video, uh, one of the, big themes of the last 15 years or so of, of software has been the transition from on-premises on licenses to uh, software as a service via the cloud. Um, and uh, FICO's in the, in the middle of that transitioning uh, these old on-premises license software deals to what they call the um, FICO decision management cloud. Um, and so that has all kinds of disruptions, you know, uh, takes a, uh, a lot of investment to transition a business from one kind to the other. Um, they'll be in a position where they have to support some of these licensed customers for, you know, a number of years ongoing. Uh, we talked a little bit about in the last video about how um, the accounting uh, reflects differently for both kinds of businesses. So it's a little bit disruptive and um, the kind of data on, you know, exactly how accretive this is for, the business as a whole is a bit uh, blurry. There's not really any true line of sight into how good this business will be, how accretive it will be to earnings, uh, what its contribution to operating 
uh, income will be over time. The things that are clear about it is that it's growing quite quickly. Uh, the company is um, being quite successful, trend, uh, signing up new customers to its decision management cloud. Um, and they've had a very uh, long history of uh, doing this basically since its founding, the, the founding principles were uh, to use data in a way to help uh, businesses make more rational uh, decisions. So it's a, it, it could be an interesting business in time. Um, I heard speculation that perhaps it could have, you know, 30% operating margins um, at maturity. We'll just have to see. The thing about investing in the company broadly is that that's not necessary for a good result. It, it's a, as much as I hate to, <laughs> as much as I hate, hate to have to say you're, you know, getting X, Y, and Z business for free, or, you know, this is a free ticket or it's a lottery ticket, whatever. Um, it is a little bit like that. It's a maturish business uh, transitioning um, to a much more economic model and it's growing very quickly in a industry that will be increasingly important uh, going forward. And probably something, you know, that is um, not a superfluous software spend item. You know, this is not the fourth ERP HR software, software system operating in a business and it's not uh, Canva, it's not marketing tools. Um, this is really nuts and bolts stuff for uh, operating a business. And it's one of those pieces of software that um, will save you, save you money over time. Big, Depending on how large the organization is and the importance of data within it, there's probably a very decent uh, chance that the contrast between the cost that the software has and the value that it will produce in terms of uh, efficiencies and savings could be quite considerable. Anyways, it's a little bit speculative. Um, it's interesting. It's not the. Um, it's not really uh, the uh, this investment being successful is not contingent on the um, decision management cloud being particularly successful. You don't need to make that assumption. Um, so yeah, we talked a little bit about the dynamics. Uh, of this uh, business, and it's fairly simple, the scores business itself. And that's really uh, the interesting part of um, FICO. So as we mentioned, you know, essentially it's an algorithm that produces a credit score on top of uh, credit data provided by the bureaus. Now, you can see there's probably a point of contention there in as far as, you know, what... Um, In as, in as far as the relationship between FICO and the credit bureaus. And we'll get a little bit into that later, but you can see there's you know, potentially a, a point there for attention in its ecosystem. Largely, you know, the, the scores are distributed um, through the credit bureaus and they're distributed on the basis of uh, credit decisions. So every time someone is applying for a certain loan, um, you know, a credit score can be run in that circumstance to gauge uh, the likelihood of performance of this particular loan. And then, you know, the lender will use that information to, you know, price um, uh, the capital they're lending out um, and terms, things like that. Um, like I mentioned as well, there's, uh, you know, the FICO scores are available directly to consumers um, through my FICO, uh, which is, been a pretty decent business for them over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, it was released in the early 2000s, and I believe it kind of makes up, uh, you know, 25% of the score's uh, revenue at this point, which is um, pretty considerable. The thing to note about the score's uh, business is because it's largely an intangible. This is an algorithm run on top of third-party data. FICO certainly doesn't own the credit reporting data. Um, this is this is not dissimilar from you know the uh, Coca-Cola um, trademark company. 
in terms of they provide largely an intangible branding um, and uh, the syrup that's uh, that the bottlers use to make the product. It's a very capital light model um, uh, that produces extraordinary um, high margins. So the, the scores business is like 90% plus gross margins, um, very high uh, operating margins because uh, for the most part, the scores business is uh, pretty well um, enmeshed in the entire Uh, is pretty well enmeshed in the entire, uh, you know, credit rate, uh, consumer credit rating ecosystem. Doesn't necessarily need to be distributed. It's already distributed, and in certain cases, like uh, mortgage lending, it's it's mandatory. Um, and in other parts, uh, you know, it may as well be mandatory. So, um, car loans, uh, for example, I think almost ninety eight percent of car loans are made using a, um, a FICO score. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic where these rating, these rating businesses seem to coalesce around uh, either a single provider or perhaps a small uh, number of providers. So in the uh, case of uh, credit ratings, in terms of Moody and S&P Global, those two companies rate, you know, eighty to ninety percent of all new issue, um, of all new issues, which is remarkable. It's a remarkably uh, high number, and the reason for that is that, um, as far as standards go, uh, standards are a time saver. They're a time and an energy saver. So it'd be completely chaotic. Um, in terms of decision making to have like 15 different standards. If you had to take 15 different standards into account and then, you know, potentially make a decision about how to weight uh, each standard, which standard to include, which standard to exclude, um, over time, that's really making any individual credit decision more cumbersome and difficult uh, to make. And so the the benefit of these um, standards, and that's what the company calls the score um, in its academic sense, these standards are things that people can coalesce uh, around. And there's there's brand power there. So, you know, in terms of a, a Moody's rating or an S&P Global rating, uh, there's a large trust factor in those names which decreases a uh, company who uses those ratings uh, cost of capital. And, you know, it's not dissimilar in uh, the consumer segment. Uh, people, um, because there are, you know, such vast numbers of credit decisions made almost every day, there needs to be ways for um, people to make these decisions uh, quickly, efficiently, um, so that the you know economy can keep on uh, growing, and that uh, any particular loan market is um, orderly, and that's one of the reasons why the government these these standard companies are quasi government monopolies because uh, the government essentially sank uh, you know um, backs a small number of these companies to bring uh, order. Um, and control to the capital markets, um, which is quite a good thing. And that's something that's irrespective of uh, any particular uh, standards ability to uh, predict, uh, accurately predict uh, loan performance. Now, there have been very large, there are, there are obviously examples in the uh, capital markets where uh, things get uh, out of whack, like uh, obviously the subprime um, subprime uh, housing crisis in the late 2000s in the United States. The uh, credit rating agencies were found with their pants down in that kind of situation where, uh, you know, perverse market dynamics had um, 
perhaps corrupted the um, the value, uh, the uh, predictability of their uh, ratings. But those are, you know, those those are things that happen in markets over time. Markets go to crazy extremes, and uh, the incentives get out of whack. But in the most part, um, these companies do offer a very significant uh, a product of significant value in terms of its its ability to predict credit performance. Generally, it's true over the cycle. It's not true in in, in every particular case. Um, but there's a there's a real value proposition there. Now, uh, one of the things that certainly separates um, FICO from a Moody's or an S and P Global uh, is the fact that um, uh, they're they're rating you know categorically different different products. So Moody's is rating um, you know debt issuances, which may be billions, uh, billions, and you know tens, hundreds billions, tens of billions, perhaps even hundreds of billions of dollars. They're rating governments. Um, and so that's, you know, a, a, a different dynamic. They employ analysts to do the ratings. Um, and those analysts, um, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a people uh, business and the, um, the credit rating agencies can afford to pay these analysts um, very good salaries, you know, often more than $200,000 a year. Um, and, you know, that analysts can, you know, bring in three, $4 million worth of uh, revenue a year uh, rating these extraordinarily large uh, debt issuances. And um, the reason why the, the debt issuers continue to come back to S and P and, um, and Moody's in particular is because with their their credit rating um, is the gold standard, and if it's rated by those companies, and often they're rated by both, debt, debt issuances are rated by both. Um, they're quite often the interest rate that will be achieved in the market will be you know ba you know basis points lower than if they went to a smaller competitor. So there's like a natural inductive uh, pricing power element there. Um, for the, uh, for these, for the consumer credit ratings, um, you know, we're not talking about billions or tens of billions, hundreds of billions. We're talking about credit decisions for a car, you know, $30,000, $40,000. That might be a lot more since used car prices have skyrocketed. Um, and, you know, in terms of mortgages, you know, that's a decision to lend three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, something like that. Um, and so the and so the um, the production of the scores is something which is largely automatic. The part that requires um, you know human intervention is the uh, particular you know secret source behind uh, the algorithm. You know what the algorithm prioritizes, etc. Um, so that's the you know labor intensive part. But that algorithm is run across you know tens, hundreds, millions of credit decisions um, every week. And the cost to access it, you know, it's a click of a button. And so the cost of um, of a consumer credit rating score is, you know, something less than a dollar. In a large number of cases, returning a FICO score could be as little as uh, five or six cents. And uh, perhaps... At, at the high end, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 cents um, to return a score. And those prices were largely unchanged for a very long period of time. So we'll get into the, uh, you know, the pricing power that the company has had and um, it chose to uh, flex. Um, but you're, you're talking about a largely automated process producing a score for not a lot of money. Um, and so the, the the dynamics of that is if you're uh, running a credit score for a half a million dollar loan and it costs 10 cents to produce the score, uh, at what point does the score become expensive or uneconomic? If you add another, if you add another like 10 cents, uh, sorry, if you add another cent, 
that's you know ten percent at, at another two cents. You know, instead of ten cents, it becomes twelve cents. That's a twenty percent immediate flex and pricing impact. You know, there's a long path there before using the FICO score becomes uh, uneconomic. And you know, in the meantime, it's still you know very cheap and accessible. This isn't something which is very expensive now. Um, the other part of this is obviously that, uh, you know, all things being equal, uh, volumes for the scores uh, tend to appreciate over time. So the number of scores being returned in, every, in any given year is a you know, low single digit grower. Um, over time, the um, the scores have been used for more and more things. Like I mentioned, you, you know, a landlord might return a score for an, a, a rental application. Um, they return for universities. They return for, for all kinds of things. So these, um, this intelligence, this um, information, will naturally get used for more and more uh, decisions uh, over time. And um, you know, it's a a very long secular trend that. Um, more credit decisions will get used over time and a larger proportion of those credit decisions, uh, you know, will need scores. And you've got, you know, various international um, catalysts, which are interesting, like um, India and China and uh, even places like Brazil, Latin America, uh, Asia Pacific, um, places which have not traditionally... Um, you know, where credit scores have not been as formalized as they have been in the United States, they will find these, um, you know, the uh, extra uh, decision management that a score can bring uh, to be appealing uh, over time. And, you know, essentially the same dynamics will play out. You know, perhaps there are smaller players that dominate a certain geography. Um, you know, like obviously India has a um, has a separate scores, eco, uh, sorry, credit rating um, has a has a different uh, credit rating ecosystem than you know all the rest of the world, and China does a lot of that with their own industries. They have separate homegrown industries to service um, a particular market, and um, you know the way that has panned out in uh, India is that you know S and P Global and Moody's have taken large stakes in promising businesses uh, over time because it, it's a natural winner take all oligopoly type type market and those companies can benefit from the IP, the association, um, the know-how of uh, these companies that have been doing it for many decades. So there's a natural incline um, for volumes over time. It's not to say that's not cyclical necessarily. Um, obviously the scores business, you know, one of the predictors, uh, you know, one of the, uh, um, one of the signs of how well the business is doing is obviously the volumes. Volumes times price equals revenue. Um, and so, you know, as there are various credit contractions and uh, panics over the years, which I'm sure there'll be plenty more, um, the business, you know, will, it will not always be, you know, straight up and to the right. You know, the financial crisis was obviously quite a large uh, crisis for the company. Um, Certainly not a not a good time, but you know remained strongly profitable. Um, and in the back end of that, there were various decisions made at the government level to um, standardise the uh, scores uh, as a way to bring uh, rationality to uh, large parts of the consumer credit market. And so there were directives in two thousand and twelve by the Consumer Protection Bureau um, that that formalised uh, you know that dynamic. And that's something that's, you know, a wind um, that will be a wind at its back for a very long time. It's not to say that those two things, the FH, the FHFA and the uh, Consumer Protection Bureau, you know, what they give us, they can also take it away. So um, there could certainly be a time when the government decides to, um, you know, take their uh, government mandated monopoly elsewhere. Uh, that's certainly a possibility. It's something that needs to be underwritten. But the essence of these uh, companies is that uh, they, they coalesce around, they're natural in their 
uh, monopoly or oligopolistic structure. You don't need to bend people's arm to use these uh, scores. They're used for the reasons we mentioned before that they bring, that they ultimately, they, they are very decent predictors of credit quality in a portfolio. Um, it's a standard people can coalesce around and they bring um, rationality to capital markets, which are all good things. Um, so, you know, a little bit of the recent history there, but, um, you know, the, the broad history of the company is that it was started in the 1950s by Bill Fair and Earl Isaac, hence Fair Isaac. Um, and, you know, famously it was started with uh, each of them had $400 that they invested. So pretty good return for both of them. Um, 800 into like 12 billion. So that's definitely compounding. Um, you know, the company followed a very typical, you know, hard slog business development period um, from its founding, getting its first sort of customers in the late 50s, early 60s, um, and then, you know, slowly making incremental um, improvements in their technology and value offering over the years where they were able to get integrated with more and more credit decisions. And they're deeply integrated um, with things like fraud detection, um, you know, protecting credit cards, um, those sort of things as well. Um, you know, the you know that that period spanned many decades um, to where we are now, where they're you know, essentially in almost every consumer credit decision making uh, in U.S. Uh, dollar denominated terms. Um, and you really had, you know, another innovation in the early two thousands where they made the scores available to uh, consumers directly. Obviously, having more information on your own uh, credit worthiness is a is a good thing. You know, you can uh, take your score and improve it, and um, you know, become a a better credit and a you know more reliable part of uh, the wider financial uh, infrastructure. Um, you had the financial crisis, which was uh, not a good thing for any of these businesses. Um, obviously, the amount of uh, credit decisions that were, that are made in a deleveraging is uh, far less than uh, what is typically made in a, a normal expansionary environment. Um, and so that period was difficult, but um, it was also a period not dissimilar for the large credit rating agencies in terms of Moody's and S&P, um, where the government made a number of directives that essentially ingrained um, these players in a lot of the credit uh, decision-making um, uh, apparatus. And that's kind of, you know, where we are today, where uh, these firms are essentially uh, government-sanctioned, uh, you know, monopolies, oligopolies. Um, the, you know, the kind of modern history in terms of things which are relevant to the company today are related to the uh, current CEO, uh, Will Lansing, um, who's uh, not necessarily a spring chicken, but you know he's been with the company for ten years now. I think he had a private equity, a private equity background uh, before this, and kind of a very deep interest in um, in uh, standards um, as a kind of academic uh, concept, and so. Um, you know, his tenure as CEO has seen a like 10x inc increase in the stock price, um, uh, revenues and earnings moving in the right direction for the first time in like a few decades. Uh, the development of this software business, it's, tr it's transitioned to the cloud um, and perhaps a more, much more rational uh, approach to capital allocation um, than, you know, we usually see in markets. Um, so he's had a phenomenal uh, tenure at the company. Um, obviously, there was a you know, from his tenure from 2012 to 2018, there was a lot of uh, ch changes made within the the company. The, the history before this is that uh, obviously the FICO standard was um, you know had been well integrated into a lot of credit decision making. Uh, prior to his tenure, uh, the problem, if you will, had been that the uh, FICO score had been 
uh, the, the the FICO score itself had been a kind of subservient uh, partner to the um, uh, to the credit rating bureaus. Sorry, to the credit bureaus, and so in 2018, 2017, 2018, the company made some very significant uh, changes to its agreements with the credit bureaus, which allowed for what they call special price increases. Now, the special price increases are a uh, politically correct term for price increases <laughs> and uh, the flexing of pricing power, ultimately. Um, which was a really great setup for the company, generally speaking. The this was an exact. This is a, almost an exact historical analogy to Buffett's investment in Coca Cola in the late eighties. Coca Cola for a long time was stuck in um, long term pricing agreements with the bottlers, uh, which were very dis disadvantageous to Coca Cola, the company that owned the trademark and that created the syrup that was used by the bottlers. And so many of these bottlers had, uh, you know, decade long agreements with, um, had decade long agreements with Coca-Cola, um, which fixed the price of the syrup and didn't necessarily allow for price increases, which is like an incredibly terrible thing because there are actually inputs to um, the uh, syrup in Coca-Cola. There's sugar, I'm sure there's other things um, that go into creating that. And obviously over time, there's there can be inflation in those costs. And if you have runaway inflation, which certainly several periods of high inflation in between, you know, the early 1900s and uh, 1987, um, that was a, you know, very bad thing for um, the mothership of Coca-Cola. Now, in the 80s, there were a number of different, there was a few different strategies pursued by Coca-Cola to um, remedy this situation. Importantly, they, they started by buying smaller, uh, you know, purchasing smaller bottling operations and then re-spinning them out with agreements that were um, much more advantageous to Coca-Cola, which would allow for, you know, uh, price increases, um, you know, inflation plus pricing, um, and that would put the bottlers back in a situation that was a lot more subservient to Coca-Cola itself. And that was a tremendous inflection point um, in the valuation of that business and the quality uh, of the business. If you're transitioning from a period of many decades where you're, you've essentially been providing this in this great intangible service at the same price, you know, you've got fixed costs, which um, go up with inflation, you know, people need to be paid more, rents more, et cetera, et cetera. And these things creep on, creep um, at you over time. And if you're actually providing a, like a monopoly, like intangible, um, and you're not able to flex that pricing power, it's your business is degrading over time. Purchasing power of the dollars it creates is getting worse and worse. And so when Coca-Cola was able to flip this relationship with their bottlers in the 80s and begin raising prices um, on the bottlers, you know, Buffett 12, 14 x his money in the next 13 years. A fantastic... Um, a fantastic outcome, certainly in terms of stock price, but the business performance was just much, much better. And so, you know, you have this thing now where I think Buffett gets uh, out in dividends more than what he initially paid for the stock position in the late eighties. Um, and so that's a, it's like a fantastic setup. And that was essentially a very similar thing that happened in 2018 with FICO they were able to renegotiate these agreements with their distribution, i.e. the uh, credit rating bureaus. Um, and since then, they haven't gone into a lot of granularity as to, you know, what kind of pricing they're um, pushing on to the bureaus. But I mean, if your average price for a credit score is $5 and you knock it up to six, that's a no, sorry, five cents, and you knock it up to six cents, that's a 20% increase like that. 
and that's not necessarily going to um, you know destroy demand for decisions that are hundreds of thousands of dollars, potentially not even tens of thousands of dollars. And there's the question that needs to be answered, which is like if um, if it's at five dollars, if it's at five cents per score now for a you know, hundred thousand dollar decision, at what point is it not economic to run the score anymore? And it's probably a very long, <laughs> it's probably a very, very long, um, a very, very long runway for that, you know, and for decisions like mortgages, you know, maybe it's several dollars, maybe it's a hundred dollars. I don't, I don't really know. Um, but, you know, if you threw an extra a hundred dollars on um, the cost of your mortgage, is that really going to like move the dial each way? Who knows? So it's a very long runway for pricing power for these things at very high rates. And so one of the uh, best examples of um, how good, how significant the pricing power has been for this company uh, was uh, last quarter's earnings call, um, which was a, a quite a good result for the company in terms of uh, financial performance. Um, but, you know, the, the dynamics were that uh, broadly, you know, credit card, uh, 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 consumer credit decisions, X mortgages were, uh, had done probably, had done just fine uh, given the environment. People were expecting um, that decisions would obviously go down as there's um, very adverse, uh, as a very adverse environment for lending at the moment. Um, mortgage was down 25% which is a very precipitous decline um, in the number of scores requested. And that makes sense because the housing market is going through a difficult period where um, volumes are going to decline. The initial decline of um, the, uh, the housing market is always uh, characterized by a lack of uh, sales because people think they can ride out the decline, right? Because it's not necessarily a mark to market asset. You think, oh, I can write out the decline and, you know, I'm not going to be forced to sell. And you get all the sales when there's forced selling. People, you know, the the cost of their um, mortgage has gone up so much that they, you know, need to sell. Or other parts of their life become tight, which um, necessitate an asset sale. Um, so that all made sense. Uh, but the uh, financial performance of the company was um, pretty stellar. Most of the margin profile was up. The revenue and earnings grew. Free cash flow grew year over year. And one of the analysts, you know, was like, why, you know, how is this the case if one of the largest reporting segments is down a quarter? And he said, is it due to pricing? And Will Lansing laughed and said, it's certainly not due to volumes, <laughs> which was his, which was like his way of saying that the, um, um, that pricing power was, was driving performance, which means that a decline in volumes is not necessarily a bad thing for this company because of how much pricing power they have. Something which really showed uh, the defensive nature of this. It, it's you know, this is it's not that it's not a cyclical. It just has much more defensive qualities that it would have in the past. Um, and so since they switched on um, the pricing power in terms of um, their agreements with the bureaus and as the capital expenditures necessary for the transition to the cloud have subsided um, and the revenue has you know kind of taken off there and people are speculating the operating income will come as well there's been a you know huge dramatic increase in the price uh, maybe i can pull up the stock chart if zoom will agree with me here we go Uh, so that's 2019. So here's like 2017, 28. So, you know, a rough price of 135 to 100, you know, 60 uh, kind of dollars. And, um, you know, the price is 440 now. It's been bumping around, you know, 500 to 350, you know, almost 550 before um, the sell-off that started at the end of last year. And so this is like broadly... Um, the current CEO's tenure, you know, 26% com compounded annual growth rate, um, which is uh, stellar. No other word for it than that. 
Um, so that's, you know, kind of uh, brings us up to where we are today. And, um, you know, behind this backdrop of pricing power um, the, and the great thing about the pricing power in this company is that it's 100% incremental to margins in the bottom line. Um, every one cent that you take up on the score price, uh, I'm not sure how much capital that takes to do. Um, perhaps a computer programmer entering a different number in the system essentially costs you zero to uh, raise the price. And um, that extra um, one cent with all things being equal, um, that goes directly to gross margin, directly to the operating income, directly to net income. And so the margin profile of the company has been um, getting better and better over time. So just kind of pull up, go from 2012 to now. And if we go to the income statement, uh, so that's revenues. So, you know, largely going in the right direction. Um, the gross margins have um, you know, fluctuated over time, but you can see since the uh, renegotiation of the uh, agreements in 2017 and 18, the gross margins have been going up and to the right. Uh, broadly, the same thing with the um, operating margins. And, you know, virtually the same thing, if not better, with the net income margins. So they've more than doubled. So all, and, you know, against that backdrop, the, um, you know, the business quality getting better while volumes and pricing power is getting better, uh, you know, essentially all that incremental capital is put into buybacks. So I think in the last year, they retired 10% of the stock. They've also, due to the you know very um, stable nature of the business over time, you could see here how the post-crisis period was um, declining uh, for large parts of the business. Um, but um, because the the nature of the business um, is so stable, they've been able to uh, run a levered buyback program um, over time. And, you know, with a business of this kind of quality, with its level of predictability, um, that's something that that's a good thing. Returning capital uh, to shareholders when you can borrow money at, um, you know, to less than 2%, something like that, and then, um, you know, deploy it back into uh, a business which might, you know, be like a four or five percent free cash flow yield at, at certain times um, um and that's going to grow like you know high teens maybe low 20 percents um you know that's obviously been very accretive um for shareholders you know over time uh there is there is competition though um so you know the the fly in the ointment, if you will, is um, uh, has been speculation about the FHFA um, reviewing the status of the FICO score in relation to uh, mortgages. Um, the software business has had a lot of question marks over time. Over you know. Uh, will it ever contribute uh, in a meaningful way to the business? How much capital will it consume while it gets there? Um, you know, how commodified is the product? Um, its growth rates uh, are usually uh, quite the the degree to which the software business grows. That's quite often a um, a question mark that the market likes to focus on. Um, and there have uh, naturally been uh, other constituencies which have been very interested in making the competitive landscape um, broader, especially given uh, the trajectory that the company is on now. So the three uh, credit bureaus uh, started their own uh, credit rating, consumer credit rating uh, standard called Vantage Score. Um, which is a very interesting uh, dynamic when you're you're in a you know a relationship with the 
our credit bureaus and they start their own product and they're still using yours, even though it would be a lot more economical for them to use, um, to use their own naturally, the lower cost for them. Um, but the reason for that is that the end users want the FICO score. And for the reasons that we talked about before, these standards tend to be um, a, a coalesce to one or, or two players. And, you know, even in the event that, um, you know, that perhaps the Vantage score is more predictive, maybe it's not, it's a little bit hard to tell. Um, if it were to get significant uh, traction, it's not necessarily a bad thing for FICO itself. Um, like I mentioned with the uh, large credit rating agencies, Moody's and S&P, um, quite often uh, issuers will use both of them. And there's no reason why a dynamic like that could eventuate um, in this particular segment of uh, the uh, debt markets uh, where a lender might you know, return two scores, wait them out something like that and um you know given the pricing power we've talked about you know if you increased um the cost for you know a mortgage decision or a car loan decision and it went from six cents to 12 cents or 10 cents to 20 cents or 30 cents to 60 cents these are not like end of the world type numbers um having said that vantage score has not you know really even put a dent um uh, in in the FICO score, and so that that's you know that's a question that will remain. Um, obviously, a large constituency in this market would, is very economically incentivized um, to use a secondary score or their own score, um, but the kind of mind share that um, FICO has is still immense, and so that may be a very difficult thing um, to get out of the common consciousness. Um, although you probably want to keep your eye on it over time. The other uh, ostentatious disruptors in the space would be uh, lenders like Upstart. Now, at the beginning of this presentation, I was talking a little bit about the philosophical underlyings um, of, of, of um, FICO. Now, <laughs> managing risk is, uh, uh, you know, I would argue that it's a lot more of a philosophical endeavor Um rather than a pure mathematical big science one. You know, Taleb is uh, always, you know, stresses this point that, you know, big data may give the um, illusion of, uh, you know, greater foresight, but, you know, there are usually simple heuristics that can um, achieve, you know, even better results just because of the philosophical underlying of them. The FICO score's ability, you know, it, it its tendency is towards a lower, a lowest common denominator, where they're not as concerned if um, you know great credits are, are, are harshly graded. They're not trying to find the diamond in the rough. They are trying for a baseline of predictability across a large number um, of credit decisions. And so, you know, if uh, and if an outlier gets cut down, that's a price that they're willing um that's a that's a price they're willing to pay the price that they are not willing to pay is um allowing a poor credit to be um you know assigned a, a fabulous credit rating and that's their philosophical understanding they're trying to make many many decisions very quickly um good ratings and not to have catastrophes large catastrophes which would naturally um, undermine the status of their standard. Someone like Upstart, um, who, you know, they pride themselves on this idea that big data can help them make, you know, even more accurate decision making in each individual uh, circumstance, which is kind of the exact opposite philosophical understanding. They're trying to uh, use big data to give them the illusion that they have, um, you know, a lot more granular detail on every single person. And so where the FICO score may have given a decent credit, perhaps a subprime rating, and that person, you know, is going to pay 8% on their car instead of five, um, Upstart's 
philosophy is to try and get uh, you know the credit rating as accurate as possible. So they want to push the push that dynamic to you know a false sense of accuracy. And that is an approach which is naturally going to be a lot more risky over time. Um, you're you're taking on more risk on the assumption that you're able to price risk better. And we'll see. Um, one of the you know things that people like to laugh about is that Upstart is one of FICO's largest um, customers. <laughs> uh, so they're you know they're kind of like we're we're superior to FICO, but. You know, the FICO score is certainly part of their uh, decision management, which is just fine by me. Um, yeah. So that's, a, that's, you know, it's competition, you know, that you want to keep an eye on, but it's not, it's not really to be feared. The, the, the fact that a lot of institutions use, uh, you know, use more than one um, reporting mechanism or, you know, more than one input into their, into their decision management uh, is not the end of the world for FICO. Um, and it's the case now, you know, there's been big cases where banks have tried to transition away from the FICO score. And um, these are, these are not, you know, these are not existential threats. Um, and so this is a business, um, you know, that kind of falls into one of the two compounder categories, um, which, you know, I've observed over the years, or at least the two that make sense from a philosophical point of view, um, you know, which have been successful investments over time for people. This is not a value calculation uh, type thing. This is the ability for a company to expand its intrinsic value at a compounded rate over uh, many years. And so there's two types of these. The first type of uh, compounding machine, compounding company, um, is a company that, you know, it, you can distill down um, its growth to return on incremental, uh, in, return on invested incremental capital times the amount of capital. So this is kind of like a um, an Amazon type business. You're investing more and more money into um, additional services, uh, warehouse space, data centers, logistics networks. Uh, you're investing, you know, into the website, into merchants, into advertising, you know, etc. There's an amount of capital that you can put to work in this business and that business gets a return from that capital. And so it's a very simple, it's a very simple calculation. So if you had, you know, a hundred dollars invested into a business and it earns, you know, $10 on the hundred. And so after year number one, uh, you've got $110. So that, that's a business, you know, and if it can, you know, take the $11 that it's going to make next year and reinvest that again, times reinvest, times reinvest, the intrinsic value of this company continues to grow over time. And in a, a situation like that, the, uh, the stock price eventually will, you know, kind of equal out to, um, you know, given that there aren't really dramatic valuation uh, discrepancies in the stock, the return of the of the stock will kind of um, equal the return on invested capital over long periods of time. And so Charlie Munger's got that quote where he says, you know, over long periods of time, it's the um, return on equity or the return on the long term return on capital, um, which will determine the stock price. And so that is obviously one type um, of business, which is Fabulous. That's the type of business that Warren Buffett said is the best type of business to invest in. Um, you obviously do the, it's not that easy to identify uh, those types of businesses because plenty of people talk about their reinvestment opportunities, um, et cetera, but you need to, need to really have a very good understanding of the unit economics, the reasons why they're going to win, so on and so forth. It, it, it's been a fruitful investing uh, theme for many, many people, but, you know, 
the calculation of uh, you know how much capital you'll earn and then the return on incremental capital is in its nature um, not super easy to predict uh, beforehand. Um, and so it's a calculation that works. It's just, you know, it takes um, very deep understanding of that business to come to a, you know, determination on that. The type of business that Buffett has um, made a tremendous amount of money in, and so this would be Coca-Cola and, you know, to an extent, Fannie Mae. This is like the, perhaps the business that's even better than the return on the high return on incremental capital business. And that would be a business that needs absolutely no incremental capital. Um, it has a, you know, there's some very powerful intangible um, which supports a, um, a, you know, a, a very necessary good or service um, which drives both pricing power and uh, volumes. And so if you can have a natural secular increase in your volumes, the demand for the unit over time, and you have an oligopolistic or monopoly um, structure within the business environment, that's a uh, recipe for business growth that doesn't need any capital. And all the excess capital can be returned to shareholders either via you know, share repurchases or dividends. And that's like perhaps the holy grail, um, you know, of uh, investing. That that was exactly you know what happened in Coca Cola and the um, the kind of uh, analogies between them are you know it's kind of gives you the gives you the shape. You know, it's it's so similar um, in the setup in that it's both an, a, a you know tremendous intangible creating this you know huge return on capital. Um, there'll, be demand, there'll be demand for volumes over time and you'll get uh, you know pricing power on top of inflation um, for the foreseeable future and you've got rational management who's going to take the excess capital and return it to shareholders in a rational way and that's you know the kind of constellation um, which has been playing out for the last five or so years and it looks like it's going to continue like this for um, quite a while. Potentially, you know, Coca-Cola was a more uh, pure version of this, you know, thematic playing out. Uh, perhaps there's a lot, there's, you know, you could, you could make an argument that the predictability between uh, consumer credit scores and um, uh, uh, caffeinated, carbonated beverages perhaps there's a delta there but there's you know a very tight uh there's a very tight um you know correlation between the setups the other one that i had down here was fanny may and freddie mac when they were first uh listed in the 80s and i believe you, you could only uh, purchase the stock if you were um a savings and loan uh which i think uh, buffett and munger bought stock in the companies via Westco Financial savings and loan they bought in California, um, and it, you know it's a very similar thing. Those guys were, you know, insuring uh, mortgages, um, and they had a a, a pricing um, advantage over other credit uh, over other um, mortgage in insurers, and they were backstopped by the government, um, which reduced their cost of capital tremendously. And so you've got these dynamics where naturally there will be, you know, as long as the population is growing, there will be, even at modest rates, you know, there'll be more mortgages over time, uh, more mortgages that will need to be um, insured to support the 30-year mortgage regime in the States. And because there's a cost advantage accruing to the largest player over time, the largest players continue to take a greater share of insuring mortgages because uh, it's just, you know, basic economics. And it's it's the same kind of thing. There's you know there's a in their case it's a cost advantage rather than some intangible, um, but you know very capital light um, and ability to continue to throw off the capital, not necessarily needing to invest all of it all the time. 
even though that's a fine outcome too. If you can reinvest retained earnings at high rates, that's a fabulous way for stock market returns as well. Um, so there's good resources on Twitter. There was a um, really good uh, write-up done by uh, Young Money Cap. Uh, you can find him on Twitter. It kind of goes over, goes into um, some pretty good detail um, on the industry and FICO's position within it and kind of, you know, the the guidance and the valuation, um, which is interesting. It, you know, optically, this is not a particularly cheap name. Um, you know, I definitely, that's a true statement. I think it's you know, trailing 12 months, it's 32 times earnings. Um, on a free free cash flow basis, um, it's like between a three and a four a free ca percent free cash flow yield. Obviously, in a regime where rates are um, three and a bit percent, um, you need to have a you know a very strong idea of where the free cash flow growth is going to come for in the future to justify that number. Uh, obviously, in the last couple of years, when interest rates have been like one less than one percent, um, owning a company with this kind of predictability and uh, free cash flow, um, you know, uh, the predictability of where the free cash flows are going to go over time, uh, that's kind of like you know a little bit of a no-brainer um, if that's how you determine risk. Um, but yeah, different calculation today. So, you know, do your own homework there. Um, there's been a fantastic uh, write-up on the company. Let me see where I can find this. Um, of uh, Dev Cantaseria. So he's... um. A fund, a fund manager in the States who invests in businesses just like this. So he's a big investor in Visa, MasterCard, S&P Global, Moody's, um, and some first-rate software businesses. Um, and he talks um, a lot about, you know, just all the stuff that we talked about before. So, uh, yeah, look, that's pretty much everything I've got to say on that. Um, it's great to follow the company. I'd really recommend listening to the earnings reports because they're uh, super inter oh, sorry the earnings calls and reading the earning and reading the reports really interesting um, so let me know what you think